Uh, you are in for an amazing treat right now. Um, uh, this is stage B. Uh, if you're expecting to be somewhere else, then uh, you probably want to run away now. Uh, but we have uh, Lydia Kostopoulos. Uh, she joins us all the way from Berlin, but uh, by way of uh, the United States and bits of Europe and bits of the Middle East. She's from all over the place. It's amazing. She's doing some groundbreaking research on disruptive technology, how it impacts society, and she's making game and art. Oh, I'm just so excited for this talk, so I'd like you to give her an enormous EMF round of applause. Thank you so much, but before I even start, I think we have to say that this is an amazing camp. This is my first time here, and it's all the volunteers who have made this happen. And so to you, I say thank you so much. This is magical. So um, my presentation is about how it's actually a magical time to be alive. And I'm looking at the different technologies that affect humanity. And um, when I was introduced, you talked about a game. I'm actually creating a card game that uh, has prompt cards to get us to think reflectively about the technologies that are being created and how they affect our society and our humanity. When I submitted this talk for uh, EMF, the feedback I got was like, that's great, but could you also be critical about the technologies? So I will be critical as well about the technologies and I look forward to your uh, questions and comments. So this presentation goes uh, from birth to death and we're going to walk through some of the different aspects. In the card game, these are some of the different categories um, that have prompt questions. So starting with birth, um, DNA editing. For those who are not aware of it, DNA editing is also called genome editing, and it's a type of genetic engineering in which DNA is inserted, deleted, modified, or replaced inside the genome of a living organism. This is great because it has the potential to take out certain inherited diseases or illnesses which means that we can live healthier and longer. This also can create uh, a new industry of designer babies, which is a hot topic right now. And the idea behind it is that you could design your baby the way that you see fit. Right now, the technology isn't there to do everything, but some of the ethical concerns are if you could change the eye color, the hair color, the skin color, if you could make the muscles stronger, or if you could even make the brain smarter, more capable. So then the question lies, if we were able to change all of those things, would we, should we? And what does that mean to us and how we think? Also, would it create, would designer babies create a new form of uh, minority or disabled community, such as those who were not able to get genetically modified to be super strong or have better neurological um, connectivity. Next item in birth is this. I'm going to give you a moment. Can you imagine a baby growing out of a woman's womb? So it's a thing. It doesn't exist yet for us, but it's a thing and it's called an artificial womb. It's a hypothetical device that would allow for external pregnancy of growing a fetus outside of the body of an organism that would normally carry the fetus to term. Right now they have done experiments with a lamb, and it's been successful for almost a month, and then they stopped it. And then with a the human embryo, they've done it up to the legally allowed limit, which is 14 days, and so they have been able to successfully grow one externally, and then they stopped because um, the laws don't allow them to continue. Uh, this is kind of the system how it works, and some of the interesting questions that it poses, uh, so first of all, positively, it would allow um, couples to have babies even if they, ha they had genetic issues to having children. Um, it would allow same-sex couples, uh, the transgender community to have children. It would also allow people to have children later on in their life. The interesting thing that uh, this creates is if we were able to have a external womb where we would create human beings, should that be regulated? And if so, how would we say you can only have two, three children created? Or you can only have one at a time. Can you have two at a time? And should there be people that couldn't have access to doing that? And how does that compare to when you do it naturally? In the category of learning, there are exciting new technologies. And um, I've listed them here. Virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, and brain-computer interface. 
So virtual reality, augmented reality, which is the picture that we have here, is where you would see your environment, but you would see an overlay on top. And this is very helpful as we learn to see things better. This is another example of that, learning about anatomy. Uh, here's an example where you have virtual reality and the screen kind of shows what this person's looking at. Um, another type of way to learn is through neuromodulation, where it is the alteration of nerve activity through targeted delivery of a stimulus, such as electric, electrical stimulation or chemical agents, to specific neurological sites in the body. And this can help give you an advantage to learn faster. This is the latest right now in terms of um, what has been shown to work and what is planned. Let me take a, a moment to look at that. Lots of potential here. Um, one that exists, this headphone that this person's wearing exists, and what that does is it puts an electric field in this area up here, so exactly if you're wearing a headband or um, a listening device, um, and it puts electric field into the motor cortex to induce a state of hyperplasticity. And when you are wearing that, and when that's active, you learn faster. But what are the consequences? I don't know. They don't know. It's one of those things that you have to wait and see what happens. So. <laughs> Another one is brain machine interface. So this is basically putting something in your brain or uh, that would be minimally invasive. Uh, that's what they're working on right now. There's some companies, one of them is Neuralink. That's uh, Elon Musk's company. And he's trying to make this happen. And what it is is when your brain is communicated to a computer, then you have extra memory, extra capacity, extra capability. So right now that's being worked on. And this would be another way to learn. So with all these exciting ways to learn, there's still one aspect that's missing, and that's passion. And I was talking to somebody who is in the Netherlands working with some universities about passion and getting students to learn about passion and find it for themselves. What those universities have found is that they have all the technology of the world. They have all the information of the world that they can give their students, but they're finding that some students, many, are not as motivated and they're not feeling as excited to do things or learn things. And so he, right now, is trying to see how he can help those universities teach students passion. And his proposal is, we need to go back to the human connection. And he's now looking for people who are very passionate about what they do, to put them in front of those students, and just for them to talk about the things that they're passionate about. And this is something that uh, technology can't do. Relationships. So this uh, picture here is a, a robot with a child. This is an experiment that was done successfully um, at a hospital where they were trying to get children to feel less nervous um, about shots and just medical day-to-day um, -day procedures. And this worked. Uh, kids felt happier when the robots were around and got to play with them and felt less stressed about the whole situation. As we have more and more robots, we're going to have more and more relationships with them. So here's one example, and then another one is um, pets. We may see more robot pets that um, we adore and have in our homes. Another one is having artificial intelligence companions, and this is actually something that already does exist, and Dr. Kate Delvin talked about it yesterday evening in her talk, Sex Robots. So this one, you can customize your um, AI to be as you like. They have different personality traits, and then you can talk with them. And this is on the AI. It also has the actual doll robot. Again, this is what Dr. Delvin talked about yesterday. And so if you can imagine, um, with our loved ones, we text them throughout the day and tell them how things are going and all of that. So imagine you had an AI which you would communicate throughout the day and, and let that AI know how your day went and that AI would respond to you in a personality that you liked. And then you could go home and, and play with that same AI and hang out. And so I see the potential of having a new form of companionship, which would be separate from human companionship. This is the, um, you may see this is familiar because this is what uh, was talked about yesterday by Kate Delvin. This is again the doll that she was um, talking about. So you could have the AI version on the phone and then come home to the um, doll. So we could see a rise in robot companions. And we have another one with caretakers. And I want to share with you some very nice pictures from a hospice uh, in Italy. They brought this robot, and this patient here is introducing herself to the robot and welcoming it to the uh, facility. 
Now this robot uh, goes to pick up a patient to help her come to the dinner table. And she uses the robot to walk her way to the dinner table. <laughs> and I think that you can see that um, this was a doll that did well over there and they liked it. The next category is identity. Uh, with more technology, we'll see our identity changing and the way that we see ourselves changing. So, what is a cyborg? Uh, a person whose physical abilities are extended beyond normal human limitations by mechanical elements built into the body. And here are two examples. Um, the one on the left, he is colorblind very severely and just sees uh, actually black and white. And for him, this was something really important, and so he installed, literally had surgery into his skull to put this device on. And what this device does is it doesn't make him see color, but it makes him feel color. And so the device has some light and it reflects on the color, and then it, in his head it comes as doo -doo 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 -doo, like different types of sounds. And so he sees color through sound. And actually, um, he even did a actual musical performance with an orchestra, and they played this, the colors that he sees, and uh, he designed it, so that was really interesting. Uh, the next one, he has this kind of um, special glasses that help him see, and he's also the first victim of uh, a cyborg discrimination um, attack. Uh, he was in Paris, and um, three people attacked him and tried to pull that off of uh, his eyes. So as we see more people connecting themselves to technology, we may also see discrimination. So it's something to think about how it is um, we help support people who are exploring themselves in different ways. In work, uh, we're going to see work transformed, again, through virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, and brain-computer interface, which we've already talked about, but as well as avatars, holograms, and haptics. So with uh, virtual reality, uh, you can go into a room, be an avatar, and communicate with others and have meetings there. And this is one way we can reduce costs and pollution. Instead of driving to work or flying a plane for a meeting, we can do this in virtual reality. With um, holograms, we can actually sit in uh, our seat and see the other person in a hologram form sitting down and have that conversation. Uh, these technologies are being developed, the proof of concepts are there, and it's only a matter of time before they become more prevalent. Haptics is an interesting one. It's uh, a technology where you can, in mid-air, kind of feel buttons and um, different knobs. And that's still in the early stages, but uh, that'll be something that will affect our lives. With augmented reality, already Microsoft has uh, a few proof of concepts out there where we would interact with um, like a, a special type of glasses where we could see our world and the augmented reality and move screens around and push buttons and all of that. In the category of stuff, 3D printing is doing marvelous things. So 3D printing is the action or process of making a physical object from a three-dimensional digital model, typically by laying down many thin layers of material in succession. What this has done is that it has allowed for mass customization. And Thingiverse, I believe that many of you are aware of, is an amazing resource where everybody shares the things that they've created and you can um, there's one here in the picture of a, a toothbrush and a, a vase, so many different ways to share the things that we make. Uh, not just sharing things, but we can also share culture. My mini factory has an initiative called Scan the World, and what they're doing is they're trying to scan culture, uh, whether it's a statue or a device, but things that are part of our culture as a globe and part of our history so that it can be shared with others. And also in the event of a destruction, such as a bombing or an earthquake, these precious items of culture could still be preserved digitally. They can also be reprinted. So if you could example, for example, if you could imagine um, a, a Greek statue from Athens being 3D printed in Australia for students to touch and see and um, visualize. Another one is scaffolding for 3D uh, body part creation. Yesterday we had a talk by Konnichiwa Kitty. Rachel, she talked, these earrings are actually from her. She talked, she's uh, doing her PhD creating uh, eyeballs. And so 3D printing also can create scaffolds. If, if she's here, I'm sure she'll have a lot of great comments about this. 
Another thing is that uh, 3D printing also helps um, people with disabilities, and in this case, uh, you see here a child who he has this amazing, cool hand that he can use, and uh, it helps him grab things because he's missing uh, his hand. However, it is not always uh, positive like that. You can also 3D print weapons, and right now there are files of 3D weapons that you can print. And finally, we are at death. So one item that I think will transform death is whole brain emulation or mind uploading. It is the hypothetical futuristic process of scanning the mental state, including long-term memory and the self, of a particular brain substrate and copying it into a computer. And then after that, the computer would then run a simulation model of that brain, and then that brain would then respond, that simulated brain would respond as if that person would have responded. And, um, but up to that point, so you'd be copying that brain up to a certain point. Whether it's conscious or not would be um, very much open to debate. So what this does is it allows for us to create a copy of ourselves, but it also allows us, this technology has not been created yet, but there are people who are working on it. Uh, if and when this does exist, it would raise questions about immortality and whether or not we should leave behind our brain. And if so, if we had a loved one, for example, who uh, passed away, should we communicate with that brain? Should we keep that person alive when they are gone? And this, I do not have answers to that. This is for all of us to discuss and, and think about. But there are technologies that are working towards this. And they do have implications on how we deal with grief and how we understand death beyond our body's death. So in conclusion, it's a magical time to be alive. And I hope that we purposefully and thoughtfully create technology and that we bring it to our lives in a way that does more good than bad. And um, the card game that I'm creating is, is meant to raise all these questions so that more people can talk about it and so that it doesn't just happen in a lab somewhere without civic society having a say in that. If you have any questions, I'd love to take them now. <laughs> Thank you so much. What an amazing talk. If you have a question, uh, please stick your hand up and wave so I can see you. Uh, I see one person there. Uh, hi. Um, the question of brain uploading and things like that, yeah. the, there's been explored in science fiction. I'm thinking Cory Doctorow's Walk Away and Black Mirror have both explored those. What's the, what do you see the importance of those sorts of um, explorations of these ideas and sort of teasing out the consequences in those uh, environments? So one of the things that comes to my mind is what if Osama bin Laden's brain was uploaded? And what if his followers today were able to communicate with that brain and that brain simulated um, would continue to provide feedback and encourage them to continue? Um, you could apply the same reasoning to Hitler. And so other ethical questions that would arise is if and when this technology does exist, um, should it be regulated in the sense that certain people would be allowed to have their brain uploaded and other people wouldn't? And if so, what are the parameters for that? So that is uh, one item that I think could be explored as well. Any more questions? Uh, I see one over there. Um, in terms of the products out there, where does the majority of the funding come from? Is it state or privately funded? From what I've noticed, it's mostly privately funded. Obviously, I've talked about a range of technologies, um, but I'm seeing more and more it being privately funded. So, for example, um, the one about brain computer interface, Elon Musk, he's funding Neuralink. So, I see most, most of the technology being privately funded. There is obviously some government funding, but I, I believe that I see it more in the private sector. Any more for any more? In which case, a huge MF round of applause for Lydia.